All right. Welcome. Welcome to another episode of the Creditor Podcast. I'm your host, Chase Palmieri. And with me today is Walter Knapp, CEO of Sovereign, a company that is providing advertising tools, technologies, and services to tens of thousands of content creators, helping them make money and grow their businesses. So Walter, thank you so much for being here today. Hey, Chase, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, so Sovereign is a big player in this space. I, I understand that maybe not everybody follows this space closely, but you guys really are a big player here. How many independent publishers and content creators is your company working with today? Um, so it's a good question. And um, um, we tend to be really intentional or deliberate about how we describe things. So just bear with me. So when I say, and, and you'll hear me probably throughout talk about our customers, um, and our customers are people who create content for a living, um, and they can be very small or very large. Um, and when we say uh, a publisher or a customer, um, the number that we have, we look at how many are active. So if we do like yesterday or the last uh, 30 days, and our def definition of active is, are they using our products? Are they invoking our products as people come to their websites or mobile apps? Um, are they logging into our system? Um, and are we helping them make money, which is money of our products help them make money? And so the active customer base is uh, a little over 6,000 customers. Some of those customers have one website. There's actually even, there, there are a number of customers that have no websites whatsoever. And I can talk about them there. You might refer to them as influencers, but um, they operate using social media, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, et cetera. And they still create content for a living. Um, and some of our customers uh, have many websites. So they're larger media companies um, like a Meredith, for instance, or Hearst. Um, and so when you look at the overall um footprint of web properties that our products are used on, again, using the same sort of 30, you know, active within the last 30 days, it's a little over 50,000. Okay. And what are some of the key offerings that you provide to those paying customers? Yeah. So it's probably worth, a, if you don't mind, I, I'm a context setter. So uh, I'm going to set a little bit of context. Please. Um, so the way I think about um, our business um, and I'm stepping back a little bit and we can talk about the roots of why we started the business and, and sort of the, you know, um, our whole thesis and, and mission, but the name sovereign is a, it's an adjective and it means to be and to remain independent. Um, and so my thought when I started the company was what if you could provide tools and technologies, products and services um, that allowed for content creators of any shape or size um, to do three things. First, understand their business better. If you understand your business better, you can make better decisions. Secondly, I know of no company that has enough time, people, or money. So our second area that we think about is how do we make our customers more operationally efficient? And then the third area is if they want to keep playing this game, they likely want to extract some value for their efforts. And so how do we help them grow and make money so that they can keep doing what it is they love to do? So I think about um, help our customers understand their business better, help our customers operate their business more efficiently, help our customers grow and make money. Um, and that's what we do. Now, underneath that, we have been acquiring companies. So we've done a number of acquisitions, um, two more within the last six months. And we've been building things ourselves to help do one or more of those, you know, one or all of those three things. Um, and I, you'll probably notice that even though we operate one of the largest advertising systems in the world, I haven't mentioned advertising um, because that our approach is again, how do we help our customers understand, operate, and grow? Advertising just happens to be one of the three dominant economic models. Um, uh, and you may or may not have seen this in your research, but 
we have an equally large uh, affiliate or e-commerce business as well, which is to me the second of the three ways that the creators make money. Okay. And do you think that advertising has kind of become a dirty word when it comes to the publisher or content creator business or just business in general? Well, if you think about like, again, I'm, I'm a context guy. So the media business is um, whether you're like a small content creator, we can call that person an influencer or a blogger, or you're the New York Times, you're, you're essentially in the same business. So the metaphor I sometimes use is like, I don't know if you've ever sailed on a sailboat, um, but there are very small sailboats that have like one sail, one rudder, you know, room for one person. And then there are very large, like mega yachts, right? That have whole, you know, teams of people and winches and pulleys and, you know, multiple steering wheels and, you know, um, all kinds of like GPS navigation systems. And, but the, the, the interesting thing as a sailor, you know, that the wind, water, waves, like weather, all that stuff is, it has the same dynamics on both, whether you're very large or very small. My metaphor here is blogger versus New York times. Right. Um, and so the way the media business from my vantage point works is you create something. You create something that you think is valuable, whether it's an article or a a video, a photograph. Um, And once you've created it, then you distribute it, promote it, put it onto your website, put it into social media, put it onto an email newsletter. Um, You know, you might, you might optimize your site for search engines. You might, you know, you do those things. And if you're any good at it, um, people will show up and spend time listening to or watching or reading whatever it is that you've created. And when people spend time with your stuff, you unlock the ability to make money. Or I should say extract value if you really want to go up a level. Like there are venture capitalists who regularly blog and they're not interested in 50 bucks from AdWords. You know, Um, they're interested in other smart people thinking that they're smart so that they can get access to deal flow. That's why they do it. Um, and so consultants do this too. They don't, they're not trying to make money on advertising. Um, but most media businesses are like, Hey, I want to make money. And so how do I make money? And there's only three ways. Um, the first way is you can give your thing away for free and you can ask someone else to underwrite it. That's the advertising model. Um, the second model is you can say, you can't read it unless you pay me money, which is sort of the subscription or membership model. Um, and then the third way is, um, Hey, I've, I've inspired some purchase behavior and I should get, uh, compensated for that, which is sort of the affiliate or the e-commerce model. Um, and those are the three models. And then, so so that's how we think about not only the media business, um, as a business, um, but we think about the economics. And then, so your question was, is advertising bad? I don't, I don't think so. I just think that like the world doesn't need more advertising. That's for sure. Um, And there are some structural issues with how advertising is done online um, that I think sort of contribute to it being overdone to the point where it becomes creepy um, and it's annoying. Um, And so I think advertising is a viable economic model but I think some of the things that we're doing today are, are probably not good in that area. Okay. And on the advertising front, specifically with online content creators and news publishers, um, my research has shown that there's a bit of a pent up demand amongst brands, a little bit of a hesitation to actually place their brand advertisements next to online news because of some of the pushback around being perceived to help fund misinformation, disinformation, clickbait, sensationalism, polarized content, all of these different kind of buzzwords that would make a brand hesitant to show up on a news site or next to a kind of a a controversial piece of content. Um, Is that what you guys are seeing in your own research and data that there is a little bit of pent up demand and hesitation to place ads on online news in particular? Um, I'm gonna answer a slightly different question, but maybe I'll get to what you're asking after. So I think 
at the root of this is the unfortunate, I think an unfortunate byproduct of media businesses, which are really trying to grab people's attention. You know, it's, it's, um, we didn't have to do this. In, in 1994, when Wired ran the very first display ad, they sort of committed the original sin um, for the internet. And they, they ran the display ad. And, and instead of making that ad um, paid for based upon the attention that it generated, which you can measure in terms of time spent. So if you think about like most other advertising mediums are actually have a temporal aspect to them. Like you have to actually listen to the podcast ad, right? Oh, yeah, you could skip it, but like in order for it to be effective, you actually have to listen to it or television. You actually have to watch it. There's a time-based aspect to it. Um, and yet most online advertising, not all, but most online advertising, um, particularly in the open web is done based upon the impression, which has no real time-based notion to it. Um, there's been some really lame attempts of like, Hey, like the, the standard for viewability requires it to be half viewable for one second, which is stupid. Um, no one can recognize something. You only see half the picture for one second. And so, but that's the way that most online advertising is transacted. It's transacted on this like kind of dumb impression model and there's no notion of attention or time. And so you see lots of bad behavior happen. Um, and then you get the byproduct, which I think is a derivative byproduct um, but not the cause, but you see like sensationalistic articles or things that grab the human psyche because we are biased to pay attention to negative information. It's a survival instinct for humans um, that we bias to stuff like that. And that happens in the news. And then, so the thing that's grabbing your attention is the same thing that Nissan doesn't want to be associated with. And that creates a problem. But I would suggest that that problem actually is like more back to how the internet constructed advertising and part of like sort of human psychology. Right. So, so I guess you would say that some of the issues we're seeing with trust and quality of online news today is really just a byproduct of the underlying revenue model for online content. I think some, I mean, yeah, to some, to some degree. Sure. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's where I tend to. I also like, if you, you know, if you, I, I, I figured because of, you know, creditors, um, you know, um, this sort of thesis of the company, um, you know, it's interesting. One of the things that's interesting to me is if you look at the internet and I'm, I'm cribbing off of, you may read Ben Thompson, but a, a number of years ago, he wrote an article, um, uh, called publishers in the smiling curve. I don't know if you're familiar with this one. No, I'm not. Uh, so he plots the internet. I think it's actually a really in, sort of an interesting, provocative way to look at um, uh, content on the internet. That he plots the internet, if you have the, the vertical axis is the value of the content. And the horizontal axis is the number of people that um, um, spend time with that content. And then what he draws is he draws a U shape. And... Um, on the left-hand side, you have things that are highly valuable, but yet they appeal to a relatively small number of people. Now, relative is an actual important word here because the internet's actually a really big place with about 4 billion people on it. So you can, you could have an article about pen, mechanical pencils and probably attract like a million diehard enthusiasts, right? Um, um, you know, for, 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 for a personal thing, for my wife and I, we have a a son who we adopted and uh, he has some, some, you know, um, health challenges. And so there are certain websites that we pay attention to that are appeal to a very small number of people that are incredibly valuable to us. Um, we listen to what they say. We would pay attention to products they recommend or, or, you know, services and, and things like that, that, that are being shown to us. Um, as you try to reach more and more people, you have to make the content more and more generic um, or more sensational or, you know, it has to, and so that actually lowers the value. If you think about it, even like, this is like this horrible, like t 
tug of war, right? Where they're like, I really want my content to be valuable and I want people to spend time with it because if they spend time and they care, like I can actually run a really interesting business. Yet news organizations, unfortunately, kind of like get addicted to going down this slope. How do I reach as many people as I possibly can? And so, you know what? That Kardashian article is going to really play. And because of the way the advertising is set up, where it's not based upon time, not based upon attention, it's based upon how many ads can I show you as quickly as possible? This, this leads to some of the structural problems with online advertising and the news business in particular. Yeah, yeah, I refer to that as the downward spiral. And I think we're seeing that play out today. Um, some people think that the solution to this downward spiral is that membership or subscription based model. Um, but I think we can agree that if everybody in the world, every content creator in the world had a paywall up, that's not necessarily what's best for consumers and probably not going to actually be sustainable for all of those different businesses because consumers themselves probably aren't willing to subscribe to thousands of different you know, monthly subscriptions. So I'm, I'm curious, when, when uh, you start working with a customer or a content creator, do you take the time before deciding on strategy to kind of analyze their form of content, their style of content, where they fit on that smile curve, and then try to decide whether they should be going for more advertising revenue versus membership and subscription-based revenue? So the short answer is yes. The longer answer is that's really hard. <laughs> so here's what happens. Like um, when you talk to, I, I spend a lot of time in the market talking to creators of all shapes and sizes. Um, when you talk to the, the senior people at these companies, the people who are sort of the publisher or the CEO, um, sometimes the editorial director, um, you can have very good rational discussions with them about that. However, the decision makers and the people that, you know, our team, we're a decent sized company now. Um, and our team will talk to the director of ad operations, for instance or the director of affiliate commerce, um, for instance, or sometimes we'll talk to the, you know, whoever's responsible for their data uh, um, strategy. They're very myopic. So they, the directors or people who run ad operations very seldom are thinking about what's a holistic strategy here. Um, and so yes, in theory, we, you know, you, 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 I don't believe, I think your, maybe your premise or your question was, I don't know that you can like do one thing. Like, I don't think you can be just a totally ad supported model. I don't think you can be a totally membership or subscription supported model for reasons you just said. I don't think you can be a totally affiliate or commerce model. You actually have to think about, hey, what's the most appropriate thing to do here? Uh, and and this is how we think about it. So when I said understanding earlier, like a lot of that is trying to understand really truly to understand your business. Like, hey, what articles are actually people spending time with? And um, should I be promoting that article into social media? Or are people spending time with that article more apt to sign up for my newsletter or perhaps pay me money? Um, and, and, and you start to like say, hey, like, it may actually be that you wanna show less ads or no ads in this area because this will drive memberships and subscriptions. And in these articles, actually advertising is probably a pretty good move. Um, and I find very few people that we talk with um, think about it that holistically. Okay, if I could push you a little further there, because as you've called out, and, and again, I think people understand this in the media business, that there are those three primary revenue models. There's the advertising, the membership subscription, and the affiliate marketing. Do you, with all of this information you have working with all of these different publishers, is there an optimal percentage for each or are you seeing a growth in the percentage of revenue capture in one revenue model as opposed to another? How, how are those percentages changing? It's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually, Chase, it's a really good question. Um, the, 
the challenge for me to answer it is when you work across the thousands and thousands of people that we work with, like they're very different. So you, there's not an answer. Um, maybe we can pick an example company, maybe even one that you don't work with. Let, let's just say maybe the New York Times, for example, if you had to guess at how much of their revenue comes from each of those three streams. Let me give you like, a, I'll give you a slightly different example. Um, so we work with uh, a number of Hearst properties um, and not all of our products. Um, but they use uh, a product that we have that does, I don't know if this is going to be helpful, but they, uh, and this is my understanding of their business. So I, I, I obviously don't work there. I could be wrong, but you know, as, as a, as a student and as someone who spends a lot of time talking with them and listening to them, this is what I see. So I'm going to pick on cosmopolitan.com, the women's magazine and website. So a very effective and very lucrative ad business, as you can imagine. They also inspire lots of purchase behavior. So um, for instance, they might write an article on some sort of new, you know, makeup product uh, and that makeup product, they might link to Sephora, for instance. So we have a, we have a, one of our affiliate technologies that they use from us um, picks up that the fact that they have talking about a product and we pick up the product and we pick up that they are linking to Sephora and then they use our tack to show the consumer wherever they are in the world, localized to where that consumer is, other merchants that also sell that product and localize the pricing. And then they give the consumer choice. So the consumer just can decide, hey, I'm in the UK, I see it in British pounds, I'm gonna buy it from Tesco, for instance, or amazon.uk, right? Or if they're in the US, they might see I'm going to buy, I can also buy that from Nordstrom's or Kohl's or Target or Saks Fifth Avenue. And, um, but it doesn't end there. So they've got advertising running. They have an affiliate strategy that gives the consumer choice running. And then they have a data strategy in the back end that's saying, when someone clicks on this product, am I capturing that information? And then I use that information to inform my advertising strategy and my advertising placements. And they use that to help inform my editorial decisions. Um, so the way in, in that might include, this person is very interested and spends time with me, therefore I should offer, you know, he or she a subscription offer. Like the best publishers in the world, and this is like, this is hard because they actually are like, one of the biggest and, you know, have the money to invest in this, but um, they, when I talk to this executives there, they think about this in a completely holistic way. And they know each of these things is tied to one another. Um, and they also know that it changes over time. So I can't give you a like, Hey, they should be doing 45% advertising and 22% you know, affiliate and the rest of it is email newsletters with a little bit of membership stream. I just, I, it's different for every publisher. Okay. Okay. And um, with publishers today, as you know, because this is your business and your market is growing as anyone can basically become an online publisher, whether just as a blogger on medium or on social media um, in this changing world where anyone can hit publish online today, what is the biggest challenge facing publishers? Is it um, attracting readership? Is it earning continued engagement from that readership? Is it subscription revenue? What, what do you think is the biggest challenge today? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so here, again, I'm going to step back and set some context. Like, yeah. um, so like the, the media business to me is endlessly fascinating. Like, I mean, like it is, is so cool. And the, and the, and the really cool part about it is it's been around for like the beginning of recorded human history. Yeah. Like, I mean, if you go back to um, the region in France where the oldest cave paintings in the world were discovered, to me, that's like the beginning of the media business, <laughs> you know, where you can imagine some, you know, caveman standing up there and like pointing, you know, at these pictures and telling a story about whatever. Um, to me, that's like the beginning of the media business, you know, um, and what's so, what's so interesting about people is we evolved to make our decisions based upon the stories that we hear and that we 
construct in our own heads. Um, and, and I think institutions, and I'm using that word pejoratively, big institutions realized this and took advantage of it. So in the beginning, it was more organized religion took advantage of it. And then the kings and queens and nobility said, well, wait a minute, we can actually be the religion. We'll just do that, right? Um, and they took advantage of it. In, in more modern times, you see the television stations take advantage of it, movie theaters, you know, the people that produce the movies often own the movie theaters themselves. So they control not only what gets produced, but what you see. Um, and um, same thing happened in radio. I was so excited with the rise of web blogging in the early 2000s, with the democratization of publishing, that you know what you create can be viewed by anyone anywhere in the world. And if you're good at it, you have an unlimited ability to reach people, make money, form your ideas, get into debates. Like I think of it as in the positive side. What I've been disappointed with is the aggregation that I see occurring with Facebook, with Apple News. Uh, you mentioned Medium. I actually, I, I have a very different perspective. I think that becomes an aggregation point. Um, I think Substack is much more interesting to me in terms of an empowerment or Patreon or you know things that I think are much more empowering. Um, so, I tend to believe that the future of media belongs decentralized. Um, and, and the good news is like the, the internet's a big place and there are seven and a half billion people in the world and only half of them are online. So like the other half should come online. Like it's the opportunities are massive, but um, I'm trying to build a company that empowers everybody else. Um, so I don't know that I, I, I don't know that I answered your question, but that's, I, I wanted to like, that's how I think about it. Okay. And, and in this world where publishing is becoming more and more decentralized as history buffs, um, fascinated with, you know, the early days and, and progress of media and online media. Now we also understand that media tends to consolidate. Um, I mean, even your company yourself, you're talking about making acquisitions and, and the, the actual institutionals that you were mentioning before, they are really big at the kind of acquisition plays. How does the how do these two kind of separate concepts play out over the next 10 years where anybody can become a publisher, but consolidation is kind of the natural trend? Yeah. So 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 to, to be clear, we mentioned that we have we have acquired a number of product companies. Um, and we um, are in the middle of trying to do more right now, but not those are, I, I, I want to be very clear. Those are tools and technologies that yeah. creators use. Um, they, and, I, and there's a couple of behavioral patterns about sovereign that I should be clear about. One, um, the customer chooses whether or not they work with us. Um, two, we never uh, require the customer to enter into any kind of long-term or restrictive agreement. They can leave at any time for any reason or no reason. They can just wake up in a bad mood. Um, we don't require them to use all of our products and services. Only use the things that matter and, and solve a problem for you. And um, that's just behaviorally how we operate. Um, and I should talk about some of the other things we're trying to do, which are hard, um, but we're trying to stop, which is the common practice in the media industry for companies like ours to reach their hands into the pockets of the publisher and take some of their money. So every uh, customer, every competitor that we work with, I think, I can't even think of one that doesn't operate on, we take some of your money. The industry refers to this as a take rate. Um, I refer to it as a vig, a rake, a skim. Um, and so we are working really hard to turn our technologies into software where the customer um, keeps 100% of the revenue and pays a fee to use the software. That is easier said than done. Yeah. Um, 
To go back to your question though about consolidation. So I think consolidation is a distribution and discovery problem. So in the internet, I mean, Google, ironically, not maybe not ironically, but Google's fundamental business model depends on a very free, very open, very fragmented, very high quality internet. They're a discovery engine, right? So if you think about like you, you go to Google to solve the problem of answering a question and going to find, you know, to find the website or what have you, right? And Google, the whole Google search model depends upon that. That is not the same as Apple News. It is not the same as Facebook. Those are clearly aggregation points where you work on their farm. You are a sharecropper. That's the deal. Like you put your content into Apple News. Apple collects the subscription. Apple's the point. And if your content goes away, it wouldn't even take a split second for them to replace your content with something else. That's not the same thing as building an audience or building a business. That's just, you know, getting some cheap distribution from Apple. Um, I, you know, I, this is why I tend to like models like Substack is an interesting company I've mentioned, um, very similar to ConvertKit, which is another interesting company uh, in, the, in the at least email sort of subscription management space. But I, I think, you know, I think that the opportunity for people is to, is to own their own audience. And it doesn't mean you have to have your own website. You can, you can, you know, use social media, um, but you've got to be, use, I would say, use it cautiously. Right. And one of the key things that Sovereign does with, with the people you work with is to help them try to understand their business. And you mentioned, you know, time on site and other forms of engagement that you'd be helping them track, which articles they're, they're checking out. But do you also have feedback mechanisms so that these content creators can better understand yeah. what their audience is liking and on a deeper level than just time spent or clicks? Yeah, so, so um, let me, th this is an important topic that we think a lot about. Um, and we have, I think we have some interesting offerings in this area, but like the, the framing was, um, this is way back when I had another company um, in the web 2.0 space that um, it, this is many years ago. And um, I would get on the phone with mostly bloggers at the time. And we had a search product and um, for bloggers. It was search for blogs. Uh, like, you know, when you go and you see a little search box up in the corner, like that was us. Um, that was a company I was uh, uh, building. And um, I would get on the phone with people and they would say, I would say, you know, you, you, I'm looking at your, your, uh, your bounce rates and your bounce rates are like 29%. And then they would blankly look at me and they would go, is that good? <laughs> And then I was like, well, wait a minute. And we started doing other you know, things. And, and as the kind of time went on, I would say things like, you know, I do this now, like, hey, you know, your average revenue per thousand pages from advertising is $5 and 47 cents. And then you pause and they'll go, is that good? And what I realized was unlike the promise of most networks, where as a participant on the network, you can get value by the size of the network. As the network grows, the value of that network gets greater, right? Most nodes on the internet don't get that. They only see them. And so they have no notion of how they sit in the broader scheme of things. They go, oh, this is my ad revenue. This is how much time people are spending on my pages. This is how much I make from my e-commerce. This is how many people that come to my website end up signing up for my newsletter or what have you. Uh, this is my bounce rate. This is like, you know, you can sort of go down through all these things, but they have no context. Right, no and benchmarking. They, don't they have no benchmarking. They have no, yeah. is that any good? Is it good for sports publishers that are like me? Or is it good for business publishers that focus on this area or, you know, or getting traffic from these different devices? Like, like they, and, and how have I performed against myself over time? Like any good athlete would say is like, how am I making progress? How am I getting, am I improving? How am I getting better? And so I think, I mean, we, this is a key piece of our strategy, but like giving our customer, when I say understanding, it, you're right. The first half of it is, understanding your business and then placing that into context. 
And then the second half, which makes it magical, which is where I think we're spending a lot of time working on it is how do I act on that understanding? What decisions now, what, like when I said in the beginning of the call, I said, hey, like people need to understand their business so they can make better decisions. Um, if you have much better information, you can, you can make a better decision. Think about that in your own life, right? Um, and so, um, yeah, that's how I think about it. Yeah, if, especially if you think of it in the context of investing, which really every business is with each new incremental dollar spent, having to decide where to invest that incremental dollar. So, you know, the biggest advantage to an investor is better information on whatever is going on and in, in the reality that they play in. And the same thing applies to an individual business. So I, I guess one of the things that Sovereign offers is because you're working with so many different content creators, you have this this ability to kind of see that aggregate benchmark data and communicate it back with the publishers. So, so on some level, you're able to capture some of the data from all of the different partners you're working with, right? So that's an explicit thing that we have in our contracts. Um, and this is something that I, that I decided in the very beginning of the company was, um, and I respect people's decisions not to do this, but we've said is, if you want to work with us and adopt a particular product from us, um, data will get generated from that product. And that data is yours, you own it. And you can, you know, you can end the contract for any reason or no reason. Um, but while you're using our products and while you're you know, you know, under the contract, you will grant to us a license to that data to put into this cooperative. And, um, that was really, I can't even tell you how hard that was to do in the beginning, because most people were like, you want to do what? Uh, <laughs> and the, the bigger or the uh, air quotes, more sophisticated the publisher was, the more they were reflexively like against that to like the point where they would like, get the hell out of here. And I was like, but wait a minute, you're, you, I get it. You're, you're a big website and you're a well-known brand name, but you, you see a, a, vanishingly small sliver of the world you operate in. And you could do that. You could say, I, I'm going to keep all of my data and I'm going to put it in. I used to use the metaphor of Scrooge McDuck. I don't know if you're you know, yeah. like where you have like your thing and you could dive into your money. Like maybe you could use that if you wanted to, but like, wouldn't you like to know everything else? Like, and the, if it, what's happened now, you know, seven years later is I believe we are the largest uh, creator data cooperative in the world. Um, and the amount of information that we see on a daily basis is breathtakingly large, as big or bigger than most of the social platforms. Um, and it's because we're on 50,000 websites. And we see people in their, like, you know, Jane Goodall saw the chimpanzees in their native habitat. You see what people are doing and, and you see how much time is being spent and you see what products are being purchased and you, and then you can give that information back to the creators in a way that says, Hey, like, here's how you're doing. Here's where you can improve. And here's like, Hey, stop running so many ads. You're pissing people off. Like yeah. it's cool to run two ads, but not seven. Um, so anyway, I mean, like, these are all the stuff that we're working on. It, it, it's, it's super fun. It's super exciting. It's really hard. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, but yeah, this is, that's what we do. And so what you're talking about there is kind of the reverse of what, what you mentioned earlier, where the promise of the internet was each new node in the network was going to be able to capture some incremental value from the network, you know, as a, as a productive participant in the network, but that didn't, that didn't really realize, but you've made that realize by combining this data in this co-op so that every publisher or content creator in the sovereign network is getting that incremental insight and value. So that really, to me, um, reminds me of some of the innovations we're seeing in the blockchain world. I'm not sure how much you follow things like blockchain or NFTs, 
where this kind of being able to own part of your network, is that something that you guys are looking closely at, but maybe hasn't made it to the point of um, something that's implementable yet? Or, or is it potentially that going to create that fourth revenue model that right now is limited to just three? So, um, so you, let me, let me answer that. So um, I think that in the, I'll say generally like crypto technologies or web three technologies, um, and you mentioned NFTs or blockchain or what have you, I sort of put them all under one umbrella. That's probably not fair, but um, I do. Um, it's just easy shorthand um, to talk about it. Um, so yes, paying attention to it. Yes. Uh, I think it's overhyped. Um, yes, I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of speculation, particularly in the NFT marketplace. If you want to buy a, you know, $100,000 gift, you can. Um, I do think if I, if I step back and I, you know, I think about this, like, um, I think there is a push towards decentralization, which I am and I think we as, as a company culturally are very aligned with. Um, I saw very similar things happen in the open source. I used to run a pretty big uh, open source division for a large public company uh, in the Linux space in the early 2000s. And what I watched there was some of the very similar things. Um, and in the early days of open source, Linux or JBoss or some of the other early you know, open source technologies, MySQL, um, they were ridiculed as a toy at the time. And um, I know of no data center that doesn't run on Linux now, you know, <laughs> like they own it, right? Um, and it was because it was this, this, you were tapping into collaboration and decentralization and people could show up and they could contribute and then they could get value from what they, you know, from the collective contributions of others. And they didn't have to know what everybody was doing um, and that was the genius of, of these big open source projects. And I think you'll see similar things happen, I hope, in, uh, the, in the content creator. And again, you can actually follow that all the way through to the consumer. I hope you will see some of those things occur. And my hunch is the, at least the best current path to that is some of the crypto uh, work that's going on right now. Okay. And um, we're, we're getting close to wrapping up here. Um, but I'm curious, did COVID change your business or the business of the, the content creators that you were working with in any way? Because it's not clear how COVID would necessarily change an online media business, but it's also been a very tumultuous and, and bumpy ride over the last two years. So has there been any kind of noticeable changes in these businesses? Uh, yes. So, I mean, crystal clear in some ways. And then in the long-term impacts, um, I think we're still a bit uncertain, but I'll give you some examples. In, um, I'm, we have, we're, we're venture capital funded from some very large venture firms. Um, and I did a series of phone calls as sort of early days of COVID back in, what was it, February of 2020, um, with lots of other CEOs. And one of the things that I kept saying on the call was, we're seeing an odd drift in advertising. I mean, we see advertising at massive scale. And I kept saying, it's fascinating to me, but like there's this talk of a virus, but I'm watching uh, hotels, rental car companies, airlines, essentially like back out of the market. They're like advertising was running at call it hundred percent. And today it's running at like 30% of what it was a week ago. And on a, on a, um, on a micro basis, you might go, Oh, well that's because Southwest is doing blah, blah, blah. But I'm like, but it's Southwest frontier United. You know what I mean? Like everybody's doing it, man. And every hotel chain and every restaurant, like they're all dialing back. Um, so we, you know, we did see a, we never saw a decline. In fact, we saw a huge bump in people spending more time online, which you would think would translate to more advertising revenue, but we saw advertisers pull way back 
Um, and even if they were buying advertisements, they were spending a fraction of what they were spending before. Now that reversed sort of as you kind of got through the year. Um, and we, we, so we see leading indicators like that all the time. I'll give you another example. Um, and it's been running hot. It, advertising ran really hot last year, um, like in a good way. Um, e-commerce is another area that is like a, um, and this is actually an interesting thing that's happening right now, but it happened last year too. Like people started buying things online a lot. And so you would think, oh my gosh, well, if you have an e-commerce strategy, you're going to make a bunch of money because you're linking to all these merchants. What happened was, and people likely don't know this, but most of the large merchant programs, Amazon was in the, in the press. You can go do a few web searches and you'll see it. They were very upset about this because it showed, a, showed them in, a, in, in an unflatteringly light, but they uh, either reduced or eliminated the commissions they were willing to pay. Because their attitude was, and it wasn't just Amazon, but it was lots of all the big merchants said, we're getting all the traffic we need. We don't need to pay you. And so what you saw was, even though people were clicking through and they were making purchases and the publishers, the creators inspired that purchase behavior, the big merchants said, we don't need to pay you for that because we're getting so much traffic. And so revenues declined. The interesting thing is that is actually, I think it's, we're seeing that reverse um, where fewer people are making purchases online now. They're going back to a little bit more of sort of your, you know, coming out of their shells, um, uh, going to restaurants, traveling and things like that. And I think what you're going to see over the course of this year is you're going to see um, the merchants get back into, okay, we're going to pay more commissions. Um, but the whole COVID thing, we have, a, we have a really interesting view because of the scale of what we see. I mean, I mean to give you ideas, like, I mean, like we're seeing a billion dollars in purchase behavior, for instance, coming through our systems. Um, and so we see, you know, we see a lot of interesting data. That's annual purchase behavior? Yeah. Okay. Wow. I'll give you some, another idea, like we, from, a, from an advertising perspective, I mean, we put... $300 million a year, almost a million dollars a day into the pockets of our publishers. Like in the, in the way we think about our businesses, how much are we generating for our, for our customers, which are creators. But um, our goal this year is to do more than a half a billion dollars into the pockets of our customers. Wow. That's, yeah. that's amazing. And those insights that you just gave. They're surprising. I w yeah, I would have been somebody that would have guessed that e-commerce would have thrived. Businesses that were set up to take advantage of kind of affiliate e-commerce traffic would have done better. But that's, wow, that's really surprising. Um, so before we get to the last two questions that I ask every guest, why don't you give any content creator, listener, kind of a quick pitch on why or how they could engage with Sovereign, as well as some additional links or places, maybe like your Twitter handle or the website URL, anything like that, that they can go check out to learn more. Um, yeah, so, so uh, everything's on our website um, and it's uh, sovereign.com um, and it's misspelled. So it's S-O-V-R-N. Yeah, I'll have that. I'll have that in the description. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, again, it's it's like the long word. Only I couldn't figure out if it was an I before E, and there's a G in there. And so I was like, you know what, S O V R N is a cool uh, shorthand for that. Uh, but yeah, everything's on Sovereign.com. The the thing I will say is that there are two big pushes that we're doing um, this year that I think are really meaningful for people. One is um, we have built advertising management software. So this is not filling the ads. We also have a very large advertising exchange or what people refer to as an SSP, but this is ad management software and it fundamentally makes the customer's lives easier. So it, it, uh, it, it makes it super easy to set up, super easy to optimize, unifies all of the reporting, and you can work with any ad buyer on the planet, including Sovereign, but also the hundreds of others. And importantly, it's software. So we don't take any of your revenue. It's literally software you can use to do that. And it makes people's lives easier. Um, and the second one is we're doing a very similar thing with affiliate link management. So um, if you want to link 
you know, to merchants and you want to use those links on a website or mobile app or social media. Um, and some of those relationships, you want to, you know, have them direct with a merchant and some of them, you don't have the relationship, but you want to be able to get to that. Mer- like maybe you're not on Nordstrom's, you know, affiliate plan or, or Sephora's or what have you. Um, this again is software that does not take any percentage of your revenue. You keep hundred percent of your revenue, um, but it unifies everything set up link management, making sure those links work anywhere um, and uh, unifies the reporting, all of that stuff. I mean, like we are trying to um, make our customers' lives easier so they can focus on the things that really matter, which is like creating great content. Yeah, makes sense. Yep, operationally helping. That's my, that's my little commercial. <laughs> that's a great little pitch. Um, and all the links you mentioned will be in the show notes. All right, so last two questions for you here today are ones that uh, will th- hopefully throw, th- they're meant to kind of throw guests off the, the typical conversation or talking points. So be prepared. First question for you is Bitcoin. Any thoughts on Bitcoin? Is it the future of money? Is it, um, is it all speculation and hype? Is it useful? Any thoughts there? Yes. All of them. It's. it's. <laughs> I uh, so I like like disclosure. I I bought a, a a couple Bitcoin back when it was a few hundred dollars. So you know, as an experiment. Um, and um, I even though it's expensive, like I both Bitcoin and Ethereum. Those are my two bets. But I um, I have a drip purchase. So like every, you know, every time I get a paycheck, so every two weeks, like it deducts a certain amount from my checking account and it auto buys, whether it's, you know, up or down. So right now it's down um, and I'm buying um, Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, it, it's also like, I think it's, it's fascinating. I like the ideas behind it. Um, I also think if you want to invest in it, you have to understand that you're gambling. Yeah. Would you say that all investing is gambling on some level? Yeah. I mean, like all investing, I think is probabilistic. Um, And um, I don't think all investing is speculation, which I think really is what investing in Bitcoin and Ethereum are. They're speculation. I think lots of investing can be done fundamentally on the intrinsic value of the asset. That requires a lot more work. Um, and I think, um, so yeah, I mean, I'd sort of divide investing into those two categories. Are you an investor or are you a speculator? And being honest with yourself about which one you are is important. Yeah. So you're talking about dollar cost averaging, which is something that I preach in my personal life to friends and family. The way that I see dollar cost averaging as the right strategy is because if the asset goes down in price, now you're just lucky because you're buying it at a discount. And if it goes up in price, all of your previous purchases in that asset have gone up in value. So it allows you to kind of never miss a dip, um, never get too emotional and sell out at the wrong time. It's this just is why of, I do it. Like I just set it and forget it. Exactly. Um, Jason Zweig, is that is how you say it? Zweig at the Wall Street Journal is like, you know, he writes about this all the time. Um, yeah. It's, yeah. If you want to do this as a, as a non-professional investor, like that's the way. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And then you don't have to keep track of it and, and ride the roller coaster as much. Okay. Last question for you here is, are we living in a simulation? Uh, does it matter? That's my response usually <laughs> is, is that it doesn't matter and that we wouldn't change our behavior one way or the other because all the same things matter whether it's simulated experience or not but if i had to kind of pull either a probability or a, you know your gut feeling is this base reality or not so um just because i believe something to be true does not mean that it is right um and um I've read the, you know, the math as far as I can keep up with it, which suggests that probabilistically we're in a simula- simula- simulation, um, but I don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's kind of the dilemma, right? <laughs> we know the numbers, but uh, our ego says, no, no, not me, not me. That's right. That's right. right. 
Well, Walter, thank you so much for joining me today. I'll let you go now. And uh, like I said, Sovereign and all those links that Walter mentioned are going to be in the show notes below. And you guys are doing amazing things in the space to help content creators make more sustainable business decisions for themselves so that they can continue creating great content that helps inform the world and move kind of this collective intelligence of the internet forward. So love the work you're doing and hope to keep talking to you. And, and uh, thanks again for coming on today. Yeah. Thanks, Chase. Thanks for having me.